Welcome back to the Savage Nation. We're going to talk about the Obama You Don't Know, an amazing 10-part series that appeared today in the Washington Examiner. The uh, executive editor is Mark Tapscott, uh, who joins us. This should be a book. Mr. Tapscott, welcome to the Savage Nation. Well, what motivated? Well, unbelievable. What motivated this 10-part series on uh, Mr. Obama? Well, we are... Um just a bunch of journalists here that wanted to know the truth and felt like things had not been uh, vetted properly in the 2008 campaign, and so we decided to take another look at Mr. Obama and his account of his life and his experiences, and we found some things that uh, he apparently forgot. Well, aren't you, violating, aren't, you, <laughs> aren't you violating the protocols of Pravda by daring to uh, publish such a series without asking permission of Mr. Obama himself? Well, my understanding of journalism is that we're supposed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. So, that's so you, you, you don't ascribe to the uh, Dan Rather, uh, Tom Brokaw, NBC, ABC School of Journalism. In your first chapter, A Childhood of Privilege, Not Hardship, you pretty much blow the lid off the myth that the Obamas suffered somewhat as a child. In fact, they had a kind of plush childhood. Both of them did. Isn't that true? Well, as a matter of fact, they, um, Barack Obama especially had, uh, uh, we have to admit, he did have some difficulties in his childhood because of his parents' right. situation. Any yes. of us would if we were in the same kind of deal. Um, yes. But from the perspective of the kind of opportunities that he had, the um, social milieu that he was able to grow up in, the economic status that he had as he was growing up, it certainly was not an underprivileged childhood so chapter one i read the article for the audience today on the savage nation a childhood of privilege not hardship in hawaii it was very interesting what is chapter two about in in the series in your newspaper the washington examiner well you may recall from uh, the 2008 campaign uh, a great deal was made of the fact that um, he called himself a constitutional law professor at the university of chicago <clears throat> right um, and in fact he wasn't actually a professor he was a, a oh. lecturer Oh, uh, which is kind of a oh, wait a minute. Idea. Now, look, you you and I both know that's simply uh, not that big a deal to to the Democrat, whether you're a lecturer or a professor. It's more or less if you feel you're a professor, aren't you a professor? Well, if you're a professor, you are going to very likely have tenure and a much higher salary. If you're a lecturer, uh, you basically are a part time contract employee. It makes a big difference. And but you say in Chapter two, the myth of the rock star professor. What does that refer to? Well, uh, Time Magazine described him as precisely that, a rock star professor. Uh, and we went in and looked at the uh, student evaluations of uh, Barack Obama, the students who actually took his courses, uh, mm -hmm. over the 11 years that he was a uh, lecturer. And mm -hmm. their ratings, the first two years, he was pretty popular. But from that point forward, he steadily went down. And in the last four or five years, he was among the least popular of the professors. So... Rock well, here's the, part, here's the part in your article that really occurred, to, it really struck my... You know, okay, Obama's byline did not appear in a single legal journal while he took... Does that mean he never wrote a legal article? Right, that's exactly what it means. He did write Is, a it, it, <laughs> Isn't that unusual for a law school professor not to write a single legal article? Well, it's especially unusual for a law school professor, and it's especially unusual for a, a law school lecturer at the University of Chicago who uh, people who have those positions then and now are expected uh, to publish legal articles. And, in fact, three of the folks that were also lecturers at the time Obama was there and who were also sitting federal judges uh, published between them about 170 uh, such pieces. So... It can be done. Words, just had a, you, uh, yeah, well, no, as a former, a former university person myself, I certainly know what you're referring to, but the average listener doesn't understand what you're saying, I don't think. You say federal judge Richard Posner, who was at the same faculty at the same time, published 132 articles between 1993 and 04, and federal judge Frank Easterbrook, also a legal scholar on the same faculty, published 32 legal articles from 92 to 2004, while Obama published no, no such articles. A legal article in that context is very simply this. Legal professors, lawyers, academics, judges, and so forth, uh, talk and debate and discuss with each other through legal journals, law journals, uh, about issues that are uh, currently in focus in the courts or uh, have been or may be in the future. And it's it's very much 
uh, part of the ongoing legal community's discussion about what the law means and how it should be administered. He didn't participate in that. What about uh, uh, when he was at, at Columbia, uh, excuse me, Harvard Law? How did he become the editor of the Law Review? How did that happen if he hadn't published anything? What we found in looking at that, and we actually did not include this material in, in the uh, <clears throat> special report that was published today, um, the whole process for becoming the head of the Harvard Law Review at that time was very much a political process. And ah. contrary to the... Uh, story that was put out in uh, 2008, uh, he was not a unanimous choice by any means. He was not even the only uh, minority candidate. There were three others. Uh, and ironically, uh, after literally, I believe, about 17 hours in this uh, marathon political bargaining session among all the candidates uh, and the voters um, on the review staff, mm. uh, Obama emerged the winner when uh, the small caucus of conservative uh, students on the staff, law students on the staff, for reasons known only to them, threw their support behind Obama. Wow. Yeah. Sounds, like they were early, sounds like they were Republicans of today uh, in some regard. But uh, the myth of the rock star professor is very intriguing, and it's part of a larger series, of course, the Obama you don't know. If you, uh, as the executive editor of this series were to be asked, what do you think is the greatest revelation in all ten chapters? Could you reduce it to the single biggest revelation? I think the most surprising one is that we found an obscure case uh, while Obama was practicing law in Chicago where he defended a slumlord uh, oh. in Chicago who had tossed yeah. out a bunch of his uh, low-income tenants. Oh, no, that's such an important story. Uh, Mark, that's a big one. I remember that now. He was a, uh, a lawyer representing a slumlord, and the slumlord evicted, was it not poor black people from a housing project after cutting off their electricity and water? Absolutely, and refusing to turn it back on for a month. And what and he so, did is <clears throat> he forced them out without benefit of an eviction process, uh, which basically told them to get lost. Uh, and, and, Obama, Obama, and Obama, wait, Obama was the legal eagle behind this? He was the, he was the slumlord's lawyer, and there's more to it than that even. But, oh. but the bottom line on that particular case is Obama got him off with a $50 fine. Um, well, the man that's was a, yeah. prominent. That's a, big fi that's a big fine in Chicago uh, political circles, 50 bucks. Common in those days, and probably oh, the yeah. point isn't either. But the man, the slumlord that we're talking about is Reverend Brazier, who uh, was uh, a slumlord, a pastor in a very big church, and most important, was very much a figure in the uh, liberal political establishment in Chicago and a big, big backer of Barack Obama. I think we need to go back to this because, truthfully, if Romney had any, well, let's put it this way, Romney should mention the slumlord past. No matter what is asked of him, he should work it into his answers. Uh, he won't do that, of course. He's too nice a man. But I was shocked to read this. That he, that Obama was the lawyer, never mind professor, it was after law school. He was a lawyer who represented a slumlord who turned off the heat and water to the poor and then threw them out in the streets without any alternate housing. And Obama orchestrated the whole thing as the lawyer. Is that more or less a fair summary of what you discovered? Well, I, w I wouldn't say that he orchestrated the whole process. What he did do, without any doubt, is he defended the process. Uh, ah. and got the slumlord off with a $50 fine. Isn't that politics as usual in Chicago, though? Very much, and that's exactly the point. Um, you know, Obama has presented himself over the years as an idealistic civil rights lawyer, a uh, uh, community organizer who's interested in helping the mm -hmm. poor, and an idealistic politician. The truth right. is, based on what we found, uh, the truth is, he's really just another Chicago machine politician. The series is Ob The Obama You Don't Know in the Washington Examiner, 10 parts. I posted it up on michaelsavage.com. I'm looking forward to reading a piece of it every day. But that, to me, is it was the greatest shock. In other words, all the other stuff I sort of... I was very interested in the details, you know, about the invented uh, uh, hardship, really it was privilege, this and that, the uh, association with uh, uh, seedy people, uh, uh, no publication of, uh, of uh, law articles, but I had no idea that he was a sleazy lawyer for a slumlord. 
That unto itself should sink his campaign, I, I would think, Mark. I know you're a journalist and I'm not a journalist. I'm a, uh, a, a rebellious commentator. So I'm allowed to say things like that. But don't you think that would be a revelation in, in the campaign? Well, uh, this should have been a revelation in the 2008 campaign. It wasn't because so many of my colleagues in the media, unfortunately, are have been and continue to be um, conscious or unconscious. doesn't really make any difference. The bottom line is they're um, basically protecting and advocating on behalf of Obama. And that let me what what has the reaction been to your series just appeared today didn't it mark so what is have you had any response from the so-called mainstream media um, nothing directly I'm sure that uh, that we will and frankly we expect uh, a very um, negative reaction from the White House um, uh. and and I suspect that uh, a good part of the news media will uh, ignore it because frankly it ought to embarrass them. They didn't report oh, this. Chapter 10, Obama brings Chicago politics to Washington, and one of your uh, right, editors writes, Chicago has been called the home of gangster government. How bad is it? And you spell it out. Gangster government, how bad is it? Many of us in America believe that we have gangster government running the country today. You think that that's a fair analysis? Absolutely, I do. And the editor who coined that term, gangster government, is Michael Barone, who Many of your uh, listeners, I'm sure, are familiar with because he's one of the editors and was the founder of the Almanac of American Politics, which is an absolutely essential source for anybody mm. who's really interested in what's mm. happening in American politics. Um, and you say that, I'm sorry, you say Barone defined gangster government as using the powers of public office, quote, to transfer the property of one group of people to another group that is politically favored, close quote. Boy, does that ever describe what, what's going on in this country today with the fake solar contracts, with stimulus funds that have disappeared. Trillions of dollars gone up in smoke. We don't even know where the money is. Well, actually, we do know where it is. It's <laughs> in the pockets of Obama's friends and, and uh, political supporters. Well, isn't that a crime? Well, let's not forget we're talking about Chicago politicians, and they are the world's masters at covering their tracks. It's very difficult to prove. But the bottom line is, as we report, um, three of every four of the $20 billion in clean energy loans that have gone out under Obama uh, went to companies that his supporters, friends and political donors, uh, own, manage, or otherwise have an interest in. You quote uh, the book, Throw Them All Out, the 2011 book by uh, Peter Schweitzer, and you say that 31 Obama bundlers and big donors whose firms receive more than $16 billion in clean energy loans and grants include Gore, uh, Silicon Valley Venture Capital King John Doerr, John Doer, Sergey Brin, that's of uh, Google, Dan Reicher and Larry Page of Google, Jim Rogers of Duke Energy, Tesla Motors, Elon Musk, wait, and CNN founder Ted Turner. How did Ted Turner wind up getting a clean energy loan? For what? Well, it's, it's a company that he has an interest in, and I don't remember the specific details oh. of, of, of his. But well, You know what? Well, here's the thing, Mark. This should be discussed by, by Romney. This is what Romney should be talking about, don't you think? Well, I certainly think anybody who's interested in, in what's going to happen in this election ought to be talking about it because it's, uh, you know, bears directly on whether or not the incumbent president should get another four years. If you want four more years of that stuff, vote for him. Yeah, with re, 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 uh, reappropriation of people's money. Incredibly, Obama, you don't know, 10-part series by uh, the Washington Examiner with us. Uh, on this topic was Mark Tapscott, the executive editor. And Mark, I want to thank you very much. I will be reading from this over the next few days. Incredible journalism. I'm proud to be an American today, and I'm proud to say there's still a journalism alive in the country. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. I'll be right back on The Savage Nation. Savage.